prophet Jeremiah, the 26th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitants? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words you have heard. Now, therefore, mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The second reading is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, the third chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. Brothers, join me, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Here ends the reading of the Epistle. Christ hath humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Under her wings, and you would not. 
Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. God's children say, Amen. Amen. In today's gospel reading, Jesus describes himself as a hen, as a mama chicken. And that might sound like a very strange way for the Lord of the entire universe, the creator of all things, the one who is victorious over sin, death, and the devil to talk about being some kind of poor, basically helpless bird. But of course, he describes our Lord very well. A mother hen protects her flock. She protects her little chicklets, wants them to come and be protected by her wings. And if you've ever seen a chicken, that's what they do. They, they, they gather them in and they cover them and protect them with their own bodies. In the story, it talked about how Herod is a fox. You know what foxes do? They eat chickens. And so again, this is like a strange thing that here you have this worldly king, a fox, strong, evil, cunning, wily, and then the Lord of all creation, a helpless thing. But think about this. Perhaps that old fox, and of course there's a greater fox that work around us, the devil. Remember how St. Peter referred to the devil as a prowling lion, something even more vicious than a fox. But think about how a fox devours a chick, but when it comes to a hen, when it comes to Jesus, remember on the cross, the devil thought that he had devoured Jesus, that he had taken Jesus into death and that he was as good as gone. But remember, death could not hold the Lord, and so that hen that the devil thought he was devouring, that old fox, choked him, didn't it? Because in Christ dying through the cross, we have received eternal life. And Jesus did not stay dead. He rose from the dead. Came back from the dead. Rose, risen, glorious. So that we too might have eternal life by believing in him. And so through his word, your Lord calls you in. He gathers you and protects you. And even though it looks like he might be weak, he is not. He has the victory. He has done it through his own death and through his resurrection. And his defeat of the devil in the grave. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that through something that seems foolish and weak like the cross, you, in giving up your life to protect and save us, have given us an eternal life through faith in you. We thank you, dear Jesus, for your sacrifice, your shed blood, your suffering, and your dying, and your determination to do this for our sake. Help us, therefore, Lord, to live as your holy children should. Help us to appreciate the gifts that you give us of word and sacrament, water, bread, wine, your very body and blood to feed us that we might not perish. In Jesus' name, amen.
It is the city which kills the prophets. Just as lambs, ox, bulls, and even pigeons were sacrificed on its altars, so it sacrificed the men whom the Lord sent to call its inhabitants to repentance. And while it is the city covered in blood to this day, it is also a city that came with a promise. Because it was to this city, Jerusalem, and its people, that our Lord has set as the goal and climax of his earthly mission. Just consider the colic for the second Sunday in Lent, which we just prayed. We prayed, O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all the adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. We pray this not through our strength or our faith or anything in us. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so these words remind us that ours is not a city unlike Jerusalem. When we pray those words, we remind ourselves that ours is a city full of sinful people. A city full of weak people who need to be called back time and time again from its wicked ways. Just as the people of Jerusalem needed to hear that message. Because we too live in a city full of people who have been called by God to walk in His ways. But have often, all too often, turned to our own ways instead. We live in a city, we sit under the roof of a church full of people who often take their unique position as God's people for granted, just as the people in Jerusalem did so long ago. Because Jerusalem, just as our city and our church today is, it is a city that needs its Lord and Savior to come and rescue it and take us away from any path that might lead to our destruction. But unfortunately, then and now, there are those who want to do things their own way, apart from heeding the word of the Lord. Luke records in his gospel that at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. At first, it sounds as if they're just trying to protect Jesus, do him a favor, keep him from going the way of the other sacrificed prophets and teachers. But just as Peter had made the mistake of trying to keep Jesus from the cross, they too had become agents of the devil. Because that's the way the devil works. He doesn't want Jesus to come to Jerusalem. He doesn't want Jesus to come to you either. You see, the Pharisees, just like the old Adam and us, they loved their religion, their power, and their pet sins more than they loved the word of God itself. So they were offended at what the Lord had been teaching. Jesus had preached that he was the only way to salvation, to the easy and broad way of human reason and works of the law and emotion were not the path. Rather, only faith in him can save a person from hell. He had offended them as he does so many today because he had made it clear that the salvation which was offered in God's kingdom was offered to all who believed in him. And that it was not based on nationality, social standing, what city you sacrificed in, or how well you attempted to keep the law or look good to your neighbor. In other words, even as Jesus was going to continue his healing and miracle making, despite the threats, his mind was set on saving Jerusalem and its people. But his great love for them, the Lord was determined that they should repent and receive God's forgiveness, just as he is determined that the same thing should apply to you and to me and all who would follow him. Unfortunately, this is exactly what got the other prophets in trouble before our Lord. It was the kind of preaching that got Jeremiah in trouble with the people. It's got what John the Baptist, his head cut off. It's the preaching of Christ crucified and him alone as the Savior that is ultimately at the root of all who want to kill or get rid of this Jesus. Then as now. 
ultimately why the Christian faith is still rejected by so many. If salvation could be achieved by just obeying the laws and commands of God or being a good person, that would be one thing. In fact, almost all heresy against the church and God's doctrine of justification is always that. To try and take away from what Christ has done and put it back on me and what I'm doing. But that's an offensive message. That there's nothing good in us that merits our salvation. And that's what people find so offensive. That we must admit we are wrong. That we must confess our sins. It's not easy to say that we too need to amend our lives because of Christ and what He's sacrificed for us. It's hard to limit salvation to faith in Christ alone. And that's what gets people angry because it cuts across the grain of our humanity and of our high opinion of ourselves. Just like we so often do not want to hear that we have sinned, the people then didn't want to hear it either. What? Then as now, they were perfectly content with the way things were going and did not want to admit they needed to change their lives, amend their ways, or repent. So their first reaction was often, what ours is? Kill the messenger. Or at least ignore and reject it. Just as Jeremiah had heard before him, Jesus would soon hear similar words to these as he stood on trial for claiming to be God's son and for preaching repentance to the people. Jeremiah was told, this man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Oh, what wonderful prophetic words to our ears. Jeremiah's response foretells of the Lord's own suffering, which will happen 600 years after he stood before the people of God. He said, only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. The true prophet does exactly that. Call the people to repentance and point them back to their Savior. And, of course, Jeremiah was a precursor to what the Lord would suffer in the hands of his own people for warning them of exactly that. Fortunately for Jeremiah, he was not put to death for his words, as was the Lord. Now, thankfully, today, we don't have to kill the prophets anymore to avoid hearing what they have to say. All we have to do is ignore the Word of God. Close our eyes and plug our ears. Drive it out of our lives. Find something better to do with our time on Sunday mornings. In our cities today, less than 30% of the people feel the need to attend services. According to poll after poll, only about 30% of young adults even claim to be connected with any specific religion, let alone Christianity. Compare this to 80 years ago, where 95% of the people in our nation claim to be Christian. Now, they could have been mine, perhaps. But what does this mean? It means that while people claim to believe in God, they often don't want to be tied down to any specific belief. We want things our way. The majority of people now feel that a generic faith and a generic God is good enough. And that's why there is so much preaching out there that never gets to Christ and Him crucified. That never dares, calls the people to repent for fear of offending. And instead, rather, inspires people to good works. But that's just preaching the law if there's no preaching of the crucified one to go along with it. Because the gospel is this, that Jesus died for your sins. That He alone is the way of salvation. And of course, that is the message which seems so irrelevant to us today. But, whether we're offended or not, we must give thanks to the Lord that He does not give up on us. He did not turn away from His mission, just as He does not stop coming to you. Wherever His word is, there you have the Lord coming to you, entering into you, so that you can have faith to believe in Him. Apart from the word, you can do nothing. And that's why we must remember God's word. Remember what Christ, not some generic God of our own making, has done for us. To help us remember that God has given us His commandments. Because yes, we are to live holy lives. And so, just as we confessed at the beginning of the service, 
to the third commandment, we are to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We confess what it means. We're to fear and love God so that we don't despise preaching in the Word, but hold it sacred. Gladly hear and learn it. You see, these, these words of God's law in our small catechism help us remind us that there's a warning for us on this second Sunday of Lent as well. That we too must listen to God's word. And we must not take either his law, which is good and wise, or his blessed gospel for granted. And yes, we today must train up our children now to love, learn, respect, and live according to God's word. And to heed the warnings from the prophets and the apostles themselves. Because it is easy to fall away. And it is much harder to keep our priorities straight or even grow in our faith once the desires of the flesh and the things of this world become stronger in our lives. Because there is no real vacuum. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit or some other spirit. And so we must heed these warnings to hear the word to be gathered in by Christ himself. And you, who are the heads of the household, especially you fathers, don't compromise in your families when it comes to going to church, studying God's Word, praying together, memorizing the catechism. It's your responsibility. Make sure it's happening. And seeing you sit there, I know that in many ways it is. But knowing my own weak flesh, I know that there is much more that can be done. You see, the consequence of letting our families and our church drift away from the truth of God's Word is truth too frightening. Death. Eternal damnation await those who ignore the words of Christ. Because remember what Jesus warned the people of Jerusalem. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Sadly, the people of Jerusalem did not listen. Even as they praised and blessed the one who came in the name of the Lord on Palm Sunday, they quickly turned against the innocent prophet, who was God's own son, who had come to save them. For Jesus had declared, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones the ones who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered you together as hen, a hen gathers her brood under her wings, as you would not. Jesus, the Savior of the world, would have spared them the suffering that comes as a result of hardened hearts. Jesus desires that all people would turn from their sin and listen to him, repent and receive forgiveness, life, and salvation. And that's why he calls, gathers, and enlightens you to believe in him. This is the work he has sent out to accomplish to bring you salvation. So that you don't go your own way, but listen to and cling to his words alone. Because Christ is the once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. Because of that, we don't need to go to Jerusalem any longer to a temple to sacrifice. The, the sacrifice has been made. Now the Lord comes to you. And he does this because he died for you. He has promised to raise you up again. He was the one whom we are to look to. Not necessarily any specific city, not to any certain temple, but to Christ himself. And so he points us to a house that is imperishable and that will never change because that's the promise of God's word. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Anything else is shifting sand and not of any use for our salvation. You see, the Lord told the people of Jerusalem then that he would be accomplishing his work in three days. He would keep on healing. He would keep on being forgiven. He was also pointing them to Another work that would be accomplished after three days. Something that would be accomplished for the whole world, not just for the people of Jerusalem. Because it was on the third day, after he had been crucified and put to death by the very peace of the people of the city he desired to save, that he would be raised up, so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And in his rising, and in his ascending to heaven, our Lord, reminds and points us to the last day, to a new Jerusalem, to a heavenly city, come down to replace the one covered in the shed blood of the prophets. Because the new Jerusalem is a city that is covered in the shed blood of the prophet,
God's own Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Apostle Paul warned the Christians in Corinth that there are many who once walked with Christ but have now turned away to their own wickedness and to the desires of the world. And we too must be very careful that that never applies to us. But thankfully, having been baptized in Christ, having been gathered in Him, protected by Him, having heard and believed His words, we join St. Paul saying, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, I pray with the Apostle Paul, dear Christians, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. Beloved Christians, in Jesus' name, amen. In the peace of God, we have